an overview of a new serial aphid in the Intermountain West. Um, we're going to be talking about Metapolophium festuque serialium. Um, I'll call it MFC probably throughout the presentation. So uh, please realize I'm talking about that one species. I am a U of I extension educator down here in Elmore County, which is right next to Ada County or close to Boise, Idaho. And my uh, county cell phone is 208-590-2286. And my email address is bstokes at uidaho.edu. And this is a wonderful picture I took years ago of an MFC infestation on wheat. And with that, let's get to it. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Boise, Idaho. I went to Capitol High School, a fantastic high school in Boise, and then went on to the best university in Idaho, which is the University of Idaho. Go Vandals. Um, I have a bachelor's in plant science with a minor in crop science. I obtained that in 2008. And then I have a master's of science in entomology, where I did my master's work on P aphids, economic injury levels, economic thresholds. And we did do some virus work back then with bean leaf roll virus, as well as P nation mosaic virus. I wrote a fantastic thesis and got my master's in 2012. Uh, during my master's, my real strong suit, though, was insect identification and taxonomy, and I've always had a passion about entomology, and this is a really old photo of me. You can tell because uh, now I have gray hair in the, my hair and beard, so uh, that's what extension can do to you. Um, outline. So today we're going to talk about serial aphids in Idaho, the Pacific Northwest, and the Intermountain West. We're going to talk about management and the IPM implications. Uh, I did think it would be relevant to cover aphid morphology and biology, a quick overview. We will talk about all the agricultural cereal aphids in uh, PNW or Intermountain West. And then Metapolophium festuque cerealium. Um, that will be MFC, and that's based on this talk. I compiled a bunch of research reports new information on a relatively new species here. Uh, we will talk about what we know so far, and then we'll talk about the MFC range in Idaho as well as the Intermountain West. And then I will cover management and IPM considerations. I think that's always key in any of these talks. And then at the end, if we have time, we'll have some conclusion and or um, open this to questions. So aphids, um, I always think of aphids as small little plant aliens. And I think this slide is relevant because aphids are just so weird. Their morphology, biology, um, how they can vector viruses is so important. Uh, we got the aliens in the bottom right. ET, a classic, of course. Uh, Arrival, which is this one in the top. Um, great alien movies. And then the old arrival with Charlie Sheen was great. So as I talk about aphids, um, I always like to think of them as small little plant aliens that are causing damage. And that is important. Um, a quick overview of aphids, generally speaking. Uh, the taxonomy, they are in the order Hemiptera. Uh, that suborder Sternorhynchia, which basically means that their mouth parts are arising from about their chest, sternum. Um, and then they're in the family aphididae. Um, it's interesting to note how speciose they are in the Intermountain West. We have about a little over 1,500 known species, so lots of species in these temperate climates. They have hemimetabolous development, meaning they have three stages, um, an egg, nymph, an adult. They may also be apterous, which means they have no wings, or a late, which means they have a winged form. This top right photo is a winged P aphid I took during my master's work. And then they have piercing, sucking mouth parts. So they are feeding, feeding on the phloma of that plant. And this little uh, diagram right here shows typical hemipteran mouth parts. Uh, you have this short little labrum here and this big labium, and that's what you might see on an aphid. But the important part is the stylets. 
and that is the modified mandibles and maxillae that are feeding from the phloem. Um, the mandibles are on the outside, and then the maxillae are on the inside. They have tongue and grooves, and they're basically, they form two channels, which are important. Uh, the top one is the food canal, and that's where they are sucking up that phloem from that host plant. And then bottom is the salivary canal, where they're uh, basically spitting on the plant and lubricating the plant for insertion of the stylets. Uh, the salivary canal also is important when we're talking about aphids as they vector viruses. So keep that in mind, especially when we go over circulative propagative viruses. Uh, so how do aphids feed? I like this diagram. Um, there's on the top right, there's a SEM photo of an aphid that's actually starting to feed there. But this diagram shows that the aphid is putting its mouth parts right to that plant. And those stylets are going inter and intracellularly through the plant, through the epidermis, through the mesophyll, through the companion cells into that phloem tissue. And that's where they're getting all of uh, the plant sap. Um, again, here on the right is an actual aphid as it's feeding. And you can see these stylets as they wiggle through and find that phloem tissue. Um, this one's also defecating. And um, if you're ever above a tree in midsummer that's heavily infested with aphids, you might feel it raining. Uh, that is not rain, that is aphid uh, feces basically coming down on you. And that's important as well. Um, aphid morphology. Aphids are small insects and they are soft bodied insects, meaning you could basically squish them and they'll pop. Again, they can be alate, which is winged or apterous without wings. Uh, multiple colors. We have a lot of colors of aphids. Uh, it depends basically on their host plant preference and species. Uh, most of the time they are ovoid, which is oval, round or elongated. Um, I like to think of aphids as this teardrop shape um, very classic aphid look. And it's really important to note here, um, the presence of cornicles. And um, you could colloquial call, colloquially call cornicles jet pipes on the end of the abdomen. And these are expelling pheromones. And it's typically alarm pheromones to alert nearby aphids of the presence of danger, whether it's predators or parasitoids or any other creature. And this aphid right here, these little drops that are coming off of those cornicles um, are probably al alarm pheromones. And cornicles are very unique to aphids. There's no other insect that has this. So if you're looking at aphids or suspected to be an aphid, look at these cornicles. They can be very long. They could also be highly reduced depending on the species but the presence of them will 100% confirm that it's an aphid that's feeding. Um, aphid symbionts. Um, these are actually really important for proper nutrition of aphids. Um, xylem and phloem are very, very nutritionally poor. Uh, I had an old professor that called them flat seven up, basically. Um, these two types of symbionts that are common in most aphid species are proteobacteria species. And they, we have two basic genera. We have rickettsia as well as buchnera. Uh, both of these have been very highly studied. Uh, they are located within the pro, mid, and hind gut, um, especially in the hind gut of the aphids. And these are important for synthesizing essential amino acids for development that are not found in the phloem sap. And this, uh, these pictures from Sakuri show that the pink and red is rickettsia. And that's just here and there. It's not as common as that green, which is Bucknera. And again, this is internally within the aphid system. Uh, aphid host plant alternation. Um, this is a classic diagram of how aphids transition through hosts throughout the year. And this is most hosts. So we'll start um, here in the winter. Most eggs, when they're in the egg stage, they hatch and they're typically on their primary host. 
Um, usually it's a perennial woody plant of sorts. And then as it transitions to the spring, um, you'll get these asexual forms um, and they can be winged or um, wingless, but usually in the early spring, there is a winged generation that fly off to a secondary host plant. And most of the time, this is an agricultural crop, something that we have great value in as humans. So this late spring into autumn, uh, they're causing a lot of damage to agricultural crops, whether it's peas, whether it's potatoes, which is grown down here, alfalfa, or our cereal species. Later in the autumn, they will produce a male generation, and those males may be wingless or winged. They will mate, and then they will lay their eggs. Um, it's quite important, too, that their eggs are very hardy. Um, they can survive temperatures of negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty important in their um, development as well. The other interesting part of aphids is they have what we call telescopic generations and ovoviparity, um, which is parthenogenesis. And you get these huge population explosions. Um, on the left is an aphid that is giving live birth to a nymph. And that nymph will be able to feed pretty much right then and there on that plant. So that's how the generations explode. Um, also notably that during the spring, summer, and into autumn, all these, all these aphids are females. And within the female aphid body plan, um, they are asexually producing more females. So you have these eggs in here that are getting into nymphs, and then they give live birth to the nymphs. But it's important too that the, the daughters and the granddaughters in this female aphid, they're already pregnant and they're already ready to start um, exploding their population. So that's quite interesting. Here you got the grandmother, the mother, and then the daughter. So um, that explains why aphid pest infestations can just explode, whether it's a field or someone's tree in their backyard very unique and uh, probably why I think of them as little aliens, quite unique in the insect world. Um, aphids as vectors. Um, aphids are well known for virus transmission and that is vectoring some pathogen to their host plant. Um, there was a great paper decades ago, decades ago about Aphids are basically flying needles. They're flying around, they're transmitting viruses, and they basically can transmit two types of viruses. They can transmit these non-circulative viruses and then the circulative viruses, okay? This depends on the virus species and the virus species relationship with that aphid host. Uh, the properties and evolution of all this is quite interesting but it essentially affects the acquisition time, retention time, and the transmission to plants. We'll go through it real quick, this diagram from New and Perry. Uh, Non-circulative viruses are typically restricted to just the stylets themselves. And the next slide will show what I call the acrostyle. Uh, that's a unique morphological adaptation of aphids. But the really important ones are the circulative viruses. Now, these are the ones that are within the plant and the aphid uptakes them and it gets within the fore, mid and hind gut. Um, there's specific receptors within the mid gut and the hind gut that allow these virions or virus particles to pass through that gut barrier into the hemocell of the aphid. And as it's circulating, it will attach right back to these accessory sal salivary glands. So that's where that salivary can canal comes into play. When that aphid is infected and this whole circulative process probably takes a couple days, um, it's also gonna depend on that virus species. But when it feeds again, it is going to inject that virus into a plant and uh, hence vector that virus. And these kind of circulative viruses are very uh, specific to their host and their vector. 
And uh, for the lifetime of that aphid, it's infected. Um, some of these circulated viruses too can also propagate throughout the aphid, which is create more variant, virions, okay? Um, the acrostyle, uh, this was um, discovered in 2010 by Uzest, and it's quite interesting. This is just the very, very tip of those mandibles and maxillae. And uh, right in this region right here is kind of a protein rich, dense area where these virions can attach to, and it's for those non circulative viruses. Um, these little graphs here and SEMs from Webster show that with uh, Mises persicae and uh, the P aphid, um, how those virions can be detected and why this acrostyle is so important when we're talking about vectoring viruses by aphids. Um, it really is a morphological adaptation and um, something newly discovered and something that we need to consider when we're talking about managing or controlling aphids and their ability to vector. Um, now on to some notable and common serial aphid species in the PNW. Um, I took some of these photos years and years ago, but from the top left to bottom right, um, right here, we have the bird cherry oat aphid, Ropalosiphum padi. Um, it's usually a darker aphid. Um, in the middle here, we have what we're calling the wheat and grass aphid, which is MFC. And that's what I'm trying to talk about today. Uh, top right, we have the Russian wheat aphid introduced in the 70s, 80s, big, lots of money put towards that. Bottom left, we have the English grain aphid. Um, you'll see this one more as this orange, reddish, green color. Uh, middle is this rose grass aphid, Metapolophium durdotum. Uh, that's of the same genus as MFC, of course. And then bottom right, we have the green bug, which is just a weed aphid. So all these are gonna be feeding on spring and winter wheat in the inner mountain west. And it's important to differentiate um, how they look and how to identify them. I see there's a couple questions in the chat as well. Um, we'll get to those eventually, okay? Um, this is the U of I MFC team. And I wanted to thank these guys before we got into some of the data that I've gathered because these guys really led the charge with MFC. Um, top left, we have Dr. Seth Davis and Dr. Sanford Eigenbrode, uh, Dr. Nilsa Bosk Perez, Dr. Laura Ingwell, Nate Foote, Dr. Susan Halbert, who helped identify it, Ying Wu, who was a great um, research assistant for Dr. Eigenbrode. We have Dr. Ibrahim Sadege, um, Dr. Sabode, and then, of course, Dr. Arash Rashed, who is helping with this. Um, without these guys, we wouldn't know much of anything about MFC, so I'd like to thank them before we move on to what we know about MFC. Uh, the history on MFC, the wheat and grass aphid. Uh, the first specimens in the United States were found in California during the 1970s, so it's been in the U.S. for quite a while. It was first detected, though, in the PNW. Um, and that was Oregon in 1994. And then subsequently it was discovered in Northern Idaho, 2011, um, with help from Ying Wu, Dr. Eigenbrode, and then Susan Halbert, who helped identify it um, from Florida. Uh, numerous recent experiments have emerged in the past, and um, we are learning more and more about this avid, especially as it disperses over the Intermountain West. Um, more recently, we have had some isolated specimens found in southern Idaho, Montana, and Kansas. Um, I think it's important, too, there's no approved common name yet. They'll all approach Dr. Arash and Dr. Sanford about maybe getting one through uh, the Entomological Society of America, as this will become an abundant aphid throughout our region. <clears throat> Aphid dispersal, but Brad, how do these little plant aliens disperse over very large areas? Um, 
they do, and they do it using low level jet streams and their wings, okay? Um, it's known that they're flying anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 feet in altitude. So that's quite amazing. This top right graph shows some of the aphid suction traps we have throughout at least the PNW. I didn't include some of the Southern or Montana here. Um, they are settling on host plants as they leave their primary woody host typically um, for their secondary agricultural host. And it's important too, they fly together in plumes within this lower atmosphere. These suction traps um, are quite amazing too. They're about uh, 30, 40, 50 feet tall. And there's basically a little motor down here and it's pulling in aphids as they fly so that we can document what kind of species are flying, when they're doing it, um, and all sorts of things. So aphids can disperse over very large distances, hundreds or thousands of miles even, and they can cross physical barriers and landscapes. Uh, that would include mountains because we are quite mountainous in the Intermountain West. Um, these aphid suction traps, oops, and networks exist throughout the United States. So they are documenting the prevalence, the dispersal, and the species abundance over time. And there is mountains and mountains of good data about aphids and um, how they are flying, when they are flying, and the dispersal of them throughout our region. Uh, more general, we're going to talk about MFC quite a bit from now on. Uh, the general identification of MFC is it's a small aphid, about two millimeters. It is spindle shaped, okay, uniformly green with no pale stripe down the medial line. So you're not going to see a pale stripe right down the medial line on the abdomen. Uh, the cornicles are long pale and cyl 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 <laughs> cylindrical, sorry. Um, the antennae are long as well. They're about three fourths the length of the entire body. And it's important too, to use experts for proper identification of MFC. Uh, we have quite a good network for that. Um, MFC host plants. Uh, this, was, this experiment was done by Seth Davis in 2014. Uh, the most preferred is wheat, so that's spring and winter wheat on the left, um, but it can feed on other important agricultural crops like barley, oat, barley and oat, and then also it colonizes some of our common grasses here. So rough fescue, blue wheat grass, blue wild rye. Um, the one important thing here that was tested was it was not um, settling on corn at all, which is very important and very good. We're happy for that. We have a lot of corn down here in Southern Idaho. Um, but yeah, if it had a choice, MFC will go to wheat by far and um, overcome all the others. MFC fecundity, and we're talking about reproduction here. Um, Fecundity was the highest among wheat and barley crops, okay? So wheat and barley were statistically significant compared to oat, rough fescue, Idaho fescue, blue wheatgrass, and blue wild rye. Um, in the greenhouse study by Davis, MFC was unable to reproduce on corn. Um, that was the cultivar de Kalb, though. But it's important to note that native grasses are acceptable for feeding and reproduction of MFC, uh, that will play a role as it disperses. We have a lot of these grasses um, in and around our landscapes, especially in the inter Intermountain West. So if wheat's not available, it can um, feed on these other grass species. MFC and virus transmission. Um, this is going to be really, really important moving forward. Uh, barley yellow dwarf virus, or BYDV. This is the most common serial infecting virus, at least in Idaho, and I would assume in the Intermountain West. It causes all these problems within wheat. It's causing chlorosis, which is yellowing, leaf roll, um, 
plant stunting, especially if that virus is um, introduced or inoculated early on in plant growth and development, you get irregular seed heads, which leads to reduced yield, um, something that's really, really important. During the Russian wheat aphid introduction in the 1980s, uh, BYDV was heavily studied. Um, right now, I can semi-confidently say that MFC is not a vector, according to Sodege 2016. And um, we have a serial specialist, extension specialist, Juliet Marshall, for the U of I extension system. Um, and she took this photo of a BYDV infection in wheat years and years ago. Uh, Juliet, I think, is now a department head, if I'm correct, um, on campus. So moving forward, barley yellow dwarf virus will be important, especially as MFC disperses. And then here's where we get into some caveats. Um, the problem with Sedegi's study is he only studied the most prevalent species of BYDV, which is BYDV PAV. Um, MFC is a vector of another subspecies of BYDV, which is RMV, remains unstudied. And there are some other considerations about this. Um, we also do not know if MFC can transmit um, serial yellow dwarf virus. Um, that is unknown to date. The really good news about this is these are circulative and persistent viruses, which means they have that close vector to host association um, with mid-gut and hindgut receptors and whatnot that are moving those virions across that barrier to the accessory salivary glands, um, which this reminds me though of Dr. Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park way back in 1993. Uh, life finds a way, does it not? So this leads to the second um, caveat with personal communication recently with Rashed and Eigenbrode, which was about a week ago actually, MFC may in fact be able to transmit BYDV subspecies PAV. Um, the caveat though here is this needs to be confirmed through repeatable scientific experiments. And they are using now a different PCR method than Sodegi back then in 2016. Um, Arash is gonna use qPCR, which is quantitative PCR instead of the conventional PCR technique. And uh, that quantitative PCR measures the amplification of the DNA or the RNA in real time. Hence, it's gonna be more sensitive and most likely more accurate when talking about the vectoring of BYDV by MFC. And I threw in a great little photo of Albert Einstein sticking his tongue out. And of course, this little cat. <laughs> Gotta have a little fun during these things. Um, another thing that's unique about MFC, it has what we call phytotoxic saliva. Um, and you can see this on this picture I took years ago, probably a decade ago. Um, these on the other side of that wheat leaf, you have MFC that's feeding and you can see these red stains that are coming from where they're actually feeding. So we believe they have phytotoxic saliva, which impacts the host plants negatively. And you see this through this red staining. This has not been studied in detail, nor identified chemically to date. Yo. Uh, most other aphid saliva, saliva that is phytotoxic has specific proteins, glucosides, life, lipases that suppress the host plant defense system. So this is gonna play a role as well as how much damage MFC can do to a crop and how important the saliva is moving forward. Um, the range, MFC range so far, um, it's widespread in Northern Idaho and the Palouse. So where you have Pullman, Moscow and that Palouse area, um, Eastern Washington as well, throughout Oregon, and in the parts of California and Nevada, 
We have several observations in 2021 in Southern Idaho. That was from Arash as well. And sampling is ongoing. I will do some sampling this summer. Uh, last summer, I had my great intern Liz doing some aphid sampling with me in some wheat fields. Uh, this was spring wheat at the very end of summer. Uh, the next uh, graph is actually better. So cereal aphid um, detection sites in the United States, and this is a survey from a 10-year survey, and we're finding them, again, California, Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, and into Montana now, okay? So MFC can be found on these perennial grasses, and especially wheat, barley, and oat. Um, it's quite interesting to see this. You can see the host plants, um, mainly it's the wheat, all these yellow dots where we're growing a lot of wheat. Um, you have a mass congregation around the Palouse. So I would characterize the Palouse as this region right here. And you can see how abundant that aphid is up there. And then more recently, um, it is expanding into Southern Idaho, Montana, um, Utah. We don't have any data or I don't have any data yet about that but this aphid is um, throughout the Intermountain West. Some MFC management options. Um, this is where I like to say I'm an expert in. Um, integrated pest management principles. The foundation of that is very, very important. Um, the first step, monitoring field aphid populations, very important. Uh, the second part, monitoring the beneficials, the predators, the parasitoids that you're seeing within those fields. Um, some might say that that's even more important than monitoring the pest population itself. Um, we also have cultural options or host plant resistance options, which would be the selection of certain cultivars or varieties. We have monitoring of biological control agents. Um, that's important as well. And then insecticide chemicals commonly used for controls. And we'll go through some of that um, as we move on, okay? I see Jennifer has a question. Has MFC been found in the Western Canadian provinces? Jennifer, good question. I don't think we've um, had anyone monitoring those. But yet, I can look into that later for you, but that's an important thing too, as it's traveling um, possibly internationally. The, this is a really older model of IPM principles. Uh, on the top, we have IPM program components. We're talking about pest sampling. We're talking about forecasting, and especially using thresholds. Um, these are going to be our decision tools for managing any pestiferous population. And then on the bottom, we have our management tactics. We have our insecticides here. Uh, that includes the biorational as well as the conventional insecticides. But we're going to combine our management tactics with cultural host plant resistance and a biological control to get an overall IPM strategy. And then when we're talking about IPM, I think we need to get behind the goals of IPM. So I've written just three goals on the right there. The goals of IPM are to minimize adverse impacts of pest control on the environmental quality and human health. I think that's something we could all get behind. We also want to maximize the profitability of pest control. When we're using dollars, we want to use them wisely. And then three is reducing a pest status to economically insignificant levels. Um, back in the 70s and 80s and 60s, they always talked about eradication. We never want to totally try and eradicate everything. Um, that's not really sound and it's basically impossible scientifically. Um, this is a newer model. This came out in 2019 and this was in, I believe, uh, Joe, and it was great. It's a newer model of IPM principles. Um, in the center, you have research, outreach, pest management, communication, planning, and organization, knowledge and resources. And we're talking about the consumers now. We're talking about sellers, the producers, economic viability, environmental safety, 
and social acceptability. Um, within these new models, I think it's great to acknowledge everything that's involved with IPM now. We're trying to expand that IPM toolbox for all of us, but it's important here that regardless of the new or the older model of IPM, the goals essentially remain the same. We are trying to help the environment, human health, maximize profitability, and again, reduce that pest status to economically insignificant levels. IPM principles, something amiss. Absolutely, there's always something missing. Someone always forgets what I see is the most important aspect. Um, neither the older or newer models mention identification. That is absolutely critical. Probably the most important first step in anything because I would say a treatment or a control action without proper identification is male practice. So consulting with an educated entomologist or expert in insect identification is a great first step, if not the most important first step. And I see that because um, as an extension educator, the most common mistake I see from my job, from the public, field men, anyone to do with agriculture, whether it's a producer, a field representative, um, the most common mistake is identification. And I don't know about you, but during the COVID um, quarantine, I love this videos, but here we got the twisted T as the proper insect identification. And that's gonna hit this IPM principles right in the face. So um, proper insect identification, I can't strongly encourage that enough. Um, aphid sampling, as far as sampling within wheat fields. Um, the best thing to do is to use a standard sweet net. It's the most efficient for aphid sampling. Um, I would recommend 100 or 150, 180 degree sweeps per field is sufficient for um, getting some kind of population for that aphid species. Um, top right, that's actually my intern from two years ago sampling some aphid fields. Uh, she has a net there and she's just brushing that um, top of those aphid or wheat plants. Um, I would be sampling in spring and winter wheat. I think that's really important. And the other thing I uh, strongly recommend is a white colored plate. You can use plastic and then you want a vial of ethanol and a paintbrush. So this is me um, actually going through a sample. I usually dump all the aphids we capture in that net in this. And uh, you pick them up with the paintbrush and put them in this little vial that I'm holding right there. Ethanol is preferred because it can uh, help retain the DNA and RNA there. Um, you can also do countings per plant and extrapolating. That works, but it's a lot of labor and a lot of time. Um, and I think in the next slide, we'll talk about other aphid sampling techniques, but take note of the beneficial insects, okay? That's crucial, um, especially the population within that field. Are you seeing a lot of some of these common beneficials around? And I'm, I'm including a short list. So we have lacewings like this, this lacewing larvae. We have lady beetles. We have assassin bugs, we have damsel bugs, minute pirate bugs. We have these hoverfly uh, larvae that are very, very good at um, predating on aphids. They crawl around and they look like little worms, but they will feed on a lot of aphids. We have big eyed bugs, blister beetles, and then we have our parasitoids, which are crucial. If you're ever monitoring uh, any kind of crop field and you see aphids that look like this, um, leave them alone. What's going on here is that aphid has been parasitized by a very small little wasp and there's either a larvae or a pupa in there and it's gonna emerge soon. And I say that because this is kind of what an aphid that has been parasitized looks like after an adult has emerged. The sea left is just the exoskeleton, that thin little cuticle layer 
and you'll see this perfect circle right on the abdomen. And basically, that's where the adult wasp, which when we're talking adult wasp, we're talking two millimeters, maybe less, has chewed its way out and is looking for another aphid to parasitize. Um, it's also critically important to understand that these are doing this work for free for us. So we never want to um, disproportionately reduce their population. Very critical to take into account when you're sampling. Um, MFC thresholds and economic entry levels. Um, economic thresholds and EILs don't cur currently exist for MFC. Uh, take it from me, I've done uh, EILs and thresholds for PAFIDs. This is labor and time intensive, okay? You're basically setting up these cages on cer a known certain number of plants. And you can see, I think this is Allie right here. She set these all up, you cage them, you put some netting over them, um, and then you're gonna count that population throughout the season. But in 2017, Ali, which was a reach in turn, showed that 16 aphids per plant can result in a 25% decrease in plant biomass, okay? Um, and this is basically similar to Russian wheat aphid damage. So for all practical purposes, you could use thresholds and EILs of Russian wheat aphid damage. Um, and you can see uh, Allie right here, she's counting aphids on the plant and it gets very labor and time intensive, especially if those summer temperatures are 95 or so degrees and you're down here counting aphids for hours. Trust me, it's uh, quite a task. Um, we talked about uh, that phytotoxic saliva here. And Ali did something else that's important here. She was talking about leaf scoring. So she came up with this little scale of zero to five, looking at those red stains from the aphids as they feed. So you could visually score random leaves within a field and come to a mean score. Again, this would be labor intensive though. Uh, she created this great graph on the uh, y-axis, you have mean leaf score, and this is visual observations compared to aphid days. And you were looking for that phytotoxic salival reaction from that host plant. Um, the correlation to yield hasn't been done yet. Either have those EILs or thresholds. Um, insecticide options for dealing with MFC. Um, we have seed treatments available. These can be effective and they can provide lasting control. So up to about 45 days, which is quite, uh, quite a long time, okay? So you're covering those early vegetative growth stages into and up to and including tillering, um, the active ingredients of these seed treatments, uh, imidacloprid, metalaxyl, thiamethoxam, captain, carboxin. Um, the important thing to note here are these insecticides are systemic in nature. So they're moving through the plant xylem and phloem. Um, some of them are neonicotinoids. So we need to think about considerations on that. Um, and also I like to try and protect pollinators with every talk I give. So as that insecticide is moving through that plant, um, there is potential through guttation that uh, some of those are taken up by pollinators and bees. Uh, most of these seed treatments, if you see seed that has been treated, it's gonna have this bright color, whether it's pink, whether it's orange, purple, blue, red, yellow. So that's kind of how you know that a seed has been treated with insecticide. Um, a lot of these can be dual function too. You can have a fungicide and an insecticide within a seed treatment. So keep that in mind as well. Um, it will provide some lasting control up to including 45 days um, during that growing season. Um, other insecticide options for MFC. We have foliar applications. Um, these are short lasting, but use recommended thresholds. Uh, that's imperative as well. The active ingredients, and the next slide is almost similar, but 
right now we're talking conventional insecticides. We're talking clopyrifos, cyfluthrin, uh, dimethoate, all of these that are listed. Um, what I was going to tell you too is when I'm talking about insecticides, I list the PNW handbooks here, and we're talking about small grains and small grain aphids, okay? Um, the current thresholds, which are in the PNW handbook, um, they're talking about aphid populations where the average is five to 10 aphids per tiller, per stem or head prior to the boot stage, okay? And then only use when populations are heavy. Um, the other thing that we need to talk about here is PHI which is your post-harvest interval. If you're gonna harvest that crop soon, there is gonna be no need to spray and or it might even be illegal to spray that close to um, harvest um, according to the label. So please read and follow all insecticide labels and all pesticide labels. Um, these are the biorationals that are listed in the PNW. Um, there are two that are listed for control of grain aphids, including MFC, and we're talking about Bovaria bassiana and Chromobacterium subsugae, okay? The main advantage of these biorationals is there's no post-harvest interval for these, and they may be least harmful to our beneficials. Um, the other thing that I like to always consider is are these as efficacious as those conventionals? And I would say, no, they're much lower. Um, also the cost per acre to treat with these biorationals is gonna be much higher. And again, the current threshold is the same as those um, conventional insecticides. So that's important to note. Um, some cultural and host plant resistant options. Uh, planting time, do you want to be earlier or later? Um, well, it really depends if you're doing winter wheat or spring wheat. Um, and if you're just dealing with aphids, at the very end, I have this wheat schematic and you can see how complicated cereal grains are. Um, winter wheat for aphids, plant later in the season. Um, ALA aphids are migrating, mating, and laying eggs opposed to feeding and or vectoring viruses later in the season. So for winter wheat, I'd say plant later in the season, allow those alates to mate and lay eggs. That way your crop's not getting infected. With spring wheat, plant earlier in the season if possible. Um, it's really quite well known scientifically that cereal aphid damage during reproductive growth um, is quite minimal, as well as if that plant was older, it's not going to take so much damage if it was infected with a virus. And then we have host plant resistance. Um, certain cultivars or varieties may be somewhat resistant to aphid feeding and damage. Um, remember resistant, I put quotes around it because there's always an exception. Um, it also may be resistant to virus acquisition, replication, and or damage. It's going to be species specific. Uh, what I do know is we need more research, research, and research, uh, which basically needs, we need some more money, right? That's how science goes. Um, there is also online a serial aphid calculator. Um, this was done through the REACH grant. This is a $20 million grant through Wazoo, OSU, and University of Idaho. Um, it should be important to note, though, before I even get into this, it is exclusive to barley, but could be used for wheat. And you put in your numbers here and it will spit out a recommendation whether to spray or where not to spray. So um, this is basically an EIL calculator. And I didn't realize it, but I helped uh, create this. This is for the Northwest Knowledge um, Network. Um, great little thing. Here is the... Uh, website right down here. So if you want that afterwards, I'm more than happy to give it to you. And they give you, you know, whether it's your yield, your crop value, how much it's going to cost to spray the application, and then your estimated crop loss damage, and it goes through that. 
Um, some other things that I think we need to consider with MFC and wheat and everything that's going on in the Intermountain West is that drought is occurring. Um, drought is hurting our wheat yields in the growing plains, in the Palouse. Um, here we had some articles from Sprague, Washington and in Kansas as well. But um, soft white winter wheat production plummeted to historic lows last year. So this is something that's very important. I do sit on the Idaho Drought Committee and try and pop on when I can, when time allots. Um, drought conditions within our inner mountain west can be minimal to severe. So we're talking about statuses from D1 to D4, D4 being the most extreme. Um, the other thing about cereal plants, uh, water stressed plants, which would be spring and winter wheat, produce 62% less above ground biomass than plants that are not water stressed. This was done up by Nate Foote. Um, the other thing here too, water stress causes chemical and physiological changes to those host plants. And it's gonna have a trophic cascade on those herbivore interactions uh, between aphids, co-colonization and viruses. And it also affects fecundity. So if we're looking at Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, almost all of our states have a drought occurring right now and this is gonna be um, impactful for yields. Um, other considerations. Interactions with MFC and other aphid species. Uh, cereal aphids interact at the host plant level and or other trophic levels. They influence and change each other. Um, Nate Foote did this interesting study here and they're talking about the effect of previous exposure to feeding by either uh, the bird chariot aphid or MFC. Um, and the really, really interesting thing here in this graph and these numbers is that previous feeding by MFC really, really impacted the growth of the bird chariot aphid. It almost doubled it. So that's quite interesting. There are going to be other synergistic effects of species, whether it was they're present at the time or prior. Uh, maybe feeding by MFC reduces all those host plant chemicals and helps other species. So that's quite interesting. Um, this is one little graph on the drought. On the left here, we have the low water. And uh, this is just, we're talking about phytohormones here. And then time, um, this was done by uh, Dr. Davis in 2015. And the phytohormones he focused on, abscisic acid, jasmonic acid, methyl jasminate, and all of these. Um, it was just quite interesting that as you have low water, the plant's not going to be able to defend itself. So that's something to consider as well, especially as I am predicting we're in another drought year. Um, the wheat schematic, I think um, this kind of sums it all up. We have so much going on with wheat and or other cereal crops. Um, starting here with the soil itself, right? We got our management inputs, uh, weeds, herbivores, pathogens, predators, uh, nematodes, and then we got our wheat root, wireworms, predators for those. We have all of our climate inputs, whether it's precipitation, CO2, solar radiation, therms, and we got our wheat shoot. And this is where the aphid's going to be. So that aphid's gonna be feeding on that wheat shoot and having some sort of effect on yield. But again, they throw in the aphid parasitoids, good guys, our generalist predators, all these are very important. Um, but the one thing we all want is better yields for our social and economy. So we're all working for this. Uh, that REACH grant I was talking about was managed by Dr. Eigenbrode and it was the Regional Approaches to Climate Change um, what really ended up happening at the end of that was there was this great book, and you can find this online for free, um, co-authored by Washington State University, University of Idaho, and Oregon State University. Um, some great information in there as it relates to dryland farming. And um, as we get to the end, and I get to some acknowledgments, um, we need to acknowledge USDA and NIFA. 
Um, it was supported by some of these projects. Um, they're listed below, but these partners, these federal partners are important when we're talking about how do we solve these um, massive migrations and as these new invasive species of pests sweep through our area. And I like to end on kind of a funny note, I hope. Uh, maybe some of you have seen Rick and Morty. Um, it's in season one, episode five, Rick creates this little box. And um, by pushing the button, you can get these me seeks and they're blue guys. And they're meant to solve problems for us really quickly. So in a perfect world, I would push this button and I would say, Dear Mr. Meeseeks, solve invasive cereal aphid insect issues in the Intermountain West. And um, the problem is this is not a simple task. And if you've seen the episode, you know what um, occurs. <laughs> so um, it's a complicated story. Um, the other thing I'd like to thank uh, before I get off here is the University of Idaho Extension System, Montana State University, uh, Nevada Extension System, Utah Extension System and Mayor for putting this all together. And I always like to put in a plug for something I've created. Uh, I was hitting on identification. Um, like I said, that's really, really important. Um, I created this website with, in collaboration with Jason Thomas. He's over in Minidoka County, which is Eastern Idaho. And we have a whole entomology team on campus for this. You can log in here, go to the submission form, submit photos, and we'll get back to you usually in a day or two. So um, trying to solve some of the world's issues. And with that, you know, I would take any questions.